Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. I'm just looking at the tide, and uh, right in front of us here, there's some rocks. So we have to move over a little bit further. Well, we can see um, the waves and the mountains, and sometimes we see seals. So you can't get it better than this. Kathy Thompson and Sue Demtrek are standing in the sand in their one-piece bathing suits on this chilly March day in Vancouver. We're at Jericho Beach, and every week I enjoy a dip in the ocean, mainly because uh, I feel it's incredibly invigorating, and it also has anti-inflammatory properties, I believe. I feel exactly the same way. I have a ritual of going in, depends on the tide, but when it's medium to high, I go in probably two to three times, if not four times a week. Plunge in uh, up to my waist for a couple of minutes and then 20 seconds of quick strokes and I I get out. I do it because it feels fantastic and it's it's life-giving. Life-giving. All right, I'm not sure that everybody would describe an icy plunge in the Pacific in March in that way. I will be back in two minutes and 20 seconds. I'll be back in 30 seconds. And that's all it takes. At most, a couple of minutes. And Kathy and Sue swear by the benefits they feel. How was it? Fabulous. Incredible. You're floating around and just getting invigorated. I have two hip replacements and I'm recently recovering, rehabbing from one about five months ago. And before I had my hip replaced, uh, I was in a lot of pain and definitely it helped with the cold water and I'm still doing it to, to help with the rehab. And I also sometimes have a sore knee after um, sports, and um, I can only go in the ocean for maybe 30 seconds because I think it's about 5 Celsius in the ocean. Even though it's only 30 seconds, it just seems to do wonders for the spirit and the, and the body. Some people might say it has um, restriction on your arteries or uh, blood flow, but uh, it doesn't affect me. <laughs> and I have a heart condition, had a heart attack, I don't worry about it at all. Been amazing. Been amazing. They keep on doing it, and they'll keep on doing it, but the science about cold plunging is not entirely as positive or clear. Nick Tiller is an exercise scientist at Harbor UCLA. He's the author of The Skeptic's Guide to Sports Science, Confronting Myths of the Health and Fitness Industry, and he is in Montreal. Nick, hello. Hello. Great to be here. Great to have you here. For people who, who don't know exactly what we're talking about, let's start with a definition. What exactly is cold plunging? Well, some people call it cold plunging, other people call it ice bathing, and these are all different terms for basically the same kind of practice, which is when you immerse your body, usually up to the neck, in cold water or even ice water, and the idea is that it can improve health and wellness, and there are all sorts of different claims associated with it that it can reduce inflammation, boost immune function, help the muscles to recover. And and this is something that we've been doing for hundreds, if not thousands of years. The Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius famously took lots of uh, ice baths and cold showers because he thought that it would strengthen his body and mind. And so this is something that's been around for a long time, and people certainly seem to still enjoy it very much. What's the thinking behind this as to why immersing yourself in a body or a bucket, or increasingly they now have fancy um, these bathtubs that are made for, for a nice plunge. What's the thinking about why putting yourself in that would be good for you? Well, there are lots of different reasons why people might engage in this kind of practice. First and foremost is a lot of people just enjoy it. You know, we heard from a few people who do this regularly, you know, a few times a week, they take a dip in the ocean and they enjoy it. It makes them feel good. And I love that people are engaging in practices that they hope will be good for their physical and mental health. Certainly it does make people feel good. Dipping in cold water causes the release of endorphins and other hormones and chemical messengers that make us feel good. And that's wonderful. And I would never suggest that somebody stop doing something that makes them feel good and that has a positive effect on their life. The problem comes when an intervention is incorrectly aligned with a functional claim. Mm. 
such that it reduces inflammation or, or most people do regular ice bathing because they think that it's going to help their muscles recover from exercise. And these are science-based claims that have actually been tested under controlled conditions. Can you explain that? Because, I mean, as somebody who runs, for example, I worry I might twist my ankle or something like that. And there's that whole rice method, right? Where mm -hmm. you elevate your foot or what have you, and you place ice on it. Um, and that is meant to reduce the inflammation. Is this not just a larger example of that? Yeah, absolutely. It's an extrapolation of this sort of what we call conventional wisdom, that when you have some kind of injury and inflammation, you put ice on it. So you mentioned the rice method, the rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Mm -hmm. Again, this has been around for a long time. The research is actually a little bit controversial on that. It's not as simple as just putting ice on something and it will necessarily recover. But yeah, ice bathing, whole body cryotherapy, any kind of cold intervention is based on the premise that inflammation is bad and that the cold somehow suppresses inflammation and facilitates recovery. Tell me more about that, because you said in some ways that people may have it backwards. Right. So when we actually look at the literature, and again, with ice bathing specifically, there are over 4 billion ice bath hashtags on TikTok alone. So this is extremely popular. And the majority of the content that you see on social media regarding ice bathing is athletes and exercisers who are dunking their bodies in cold water, staying there usually for 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes under the premise that it will help with recovery. But there are a couple of things that we know from the scientific literature that have been very well established over the last decade or so. First of all, regular immersion in cold water suppresses the body's ability to lay down new proteins in the muscle. So we can think of this as like a construction crew assembling steel beams to support the infrastructure of a building, for example. And it's a really important part of the growth and maintenance of muscle after exercise. But the research shows quite unequivocally that ice bathing suppresses your body's ability to do this. So that's one aspect. It's also very clear that the other way that your muscles adapt to exercise is through various processes that promote the growth and repair of the tissues. And these include the release of growth factors and other hormones. And again, ice bathing blunts these signaling pathways and actually slows recovery. Uh, so in lots of literature reviews that have been published, regular ice bathing actually inhibits strength and muscle mass adaptations. So in terms of using ice baths for recovery, athletes and exercisers have absolutely got it backwards. Why do you think, given that, and given what the literature says, this is so popular? Again, the reason that people will do this is because they see, you know, athletes, LeBron James, Caitlin Clark, whoever they want to see come off the, the court, uh, and they end up in, in that bath filled with ice cubes because they think that that's going to create this recovery, and then people will follow that. If, if, if the science doesn't prove that, why do you think it has taken off in the way that it has? Well, there are a couple of things going on here. First of all, the research that we're doing in the lab is not making it through to the layperson. So there is there's some kind of inhibition of the translation of the science. So scientists are sort of working in silos. They're talking with each other. They're publishing in scientific journals. But the people, the exercisers and the athletes and the people who are just sort of trying to improve their health and wellness on a day-to-day -day basis. They're not being informed of the science. And if they are, the science has gone through the digital media's meat grinder, so to speak, and it's coming out at the other end and it's being misappropriated and misrepresented. So that's one problem. The other issue, of course, is the pervasive use of social media. You have lots of high-profile athletes and celebrities who enjoy doing ice baths. And it's these examples that are going to be most widely shared and most widely viewed on social media. So high profile athletes who engage in these practices are pioneering population trends in the use of these interventions. And they're not necessarily evidence based. You wrote a piece about a man named David who uh, had gone for a long run and had seen some of these trends, perhaps on social media, had heard about right. the ice bath, um, filled up his bathtub with freezing cold water and ice stripped off cupped his genitals and then slid into the ice bath. Who was David? Yeah, so uh, David was actually me. I, I started <laughs> off by talking about this, this uh, theoretical individual, uh, but I did admit halfway through the article, okay, David is a, is a fictional creation. It's actually, that was me back in 2005 when I was doing long distance running. This was before I was practicing as an exercise scientist, before mm. I'd really become a a critical thinker. But you were somebody who, who, who was taken by that idea that perhaps this could help you. 
Well, absolutely, because first of all, it's it's plausible, right? It sounds like it should be true that if you have some kind of inflammation in the body, you apply cold to it, that you'll suppress the inflammation and help help with recovery. And plus, I'd seen all of the athletes and celebrities, especially revered athletes, people who I respected in distance running and in high level sport that were doing ice baths. And it's just conventional wisdom that this is just what you do to recover. But actually, as a good thinker, as a, somebody who's interested in critical thinking and skepticism, we've always got to peel back the layers and ask more questions. Okay, does this actually work in the way that it's being claimed? And what's the evidence for this assertion? Because on the one hand, okay, lots of people are just doing ice bathing and maybe what's the harm? The other way that you can look at this is that it can cause harm. And there are lots of very tragic case studies of people taking these cold plunges and suffering some kind of cardiovascular event. So they're not exclusively benign. Also, as as I've just been mentioning, we've got it a little bit backwards. It can actually inhibit recovery in the long term. So without asking those extra questions, without speaking to the experts, without looking to the evidence, we're actually inhibiting our body's ability to recover from exercise. One of the reasons why we wanted to do this series was because the wellness industry is, it seems like ubiquitous, incredibly well-funded and resourced, but also incredibly successful at selling us things, um, whether they're supplements or whether they are techniques that are going to make us a better version of ourselves. When you take a look at other trends in sport and exercise in particular, what are some of the things that seem to promise a lot, but when you apply that skeptical eye and you apply some rigor to it, perhaps does not um, come true based on evidence? Well, I'm asked this question quite a lot and people think that I'm just being pessimistic or negative with or cynical with my answer. And and I promise I'm not being belligerent that the reality is that there is little to no regulation in the wellness industry. Manufacturers can come up with whatever products they like, make whatever claims they like. They don't have to prove their assertions at all. And so the vast majority of products that we are being sold in commercial health and wellness don't deliver on their promises. So it would actually be much easier to name the types of products that are supported by evidence than to try and do it the other way around. So we'd be here all day trying to list all the products that don't work. Usually the alternative therapies, the ancient Chinese therapies and the ancient Chinese medicines, or sometimes we call them CAM, complementary and alternative medicines. Mm -hmm. These are an entire sub-industry in and of themselves. So we're talking about Reiki and cupping and acupuncture, homeopathy. These practices rake in millions, if not trillions of dollars every year. Scientists basically agree that these are pseudosciences. So they are practices that are masquerading as real science, but that actually don't follow any of the processes. They're certainly not evidence based. Uh, I can talk very briefly about uh, Reiki and cupping. These are ancient Chinese therapies. They're called energy medicines. They're based on the premise that blocked energy flow in the body is the cause of various ailments. And these principles were very good. They were wonderful hundreds of years ago when we didn't know how the body worked and before science gave us a better way of healing the body. Uh, But scientists today, with all of the technologies and knowledge that we have at our disposal, they agree that energy medicines like Reiki, cupping, acupuncture, they aren't supported by modern science. But these things are already so well established and they're so popular that it's a bit like a runaway train. And I don't think we'll ever have the regulations in place to discourage people from using them. You know that in saying that, you and I will hear from a lot of people who perhaps practice those practices, but also subscribe to them, say that they've changed their lives, who will say that that's a Western bias? Well, you could call it a Western bias. I call it uh, an evidence bias in that we have the evidence that these things don't actually work because we don't have to necessarily just go off uh, this sort of Western idea and and, uh, materialism. These practices, for the most part, have been tested under controlled conditions, and the evidence shows that the effects are indistinguishable from imagined effects, what we call placebo. I don't have anything against the alternative therapies, Reiki cupping, acupuncture. I see that they're very popular and a lot of people swear by them, but I'm a scientist. I have to point my nose in the direction of the research, in the direction of the evidence, because otherwise, if if you don't have some kind of threshold for what you will and won't believe, what you will and won't practice, you'll believe and you'll practice everything. And we don't have enough time and we don't have enough resources to practice everything. What about supplements? You can listen to um, a podcast 
and half the ads, it seems like, will be for some sort of supplement, uh, some powder that I can put in my drink early in the morning, and it will make me uh, a better athlete, a better thinker, just a better person, because it has all of these uh, things in it that, that, that will improve my life. Is there any evidence that those supplements will do what they promise they will do? The supplement industry, certainly in, in the Americas, is one of the least regulated industries of all health and wellness. There are something like 30,000 different dietary supplements available on the market. That's just in the US. The FDA is supposed to be regulating this. They don't do a very good job. And actually, the regulations surrounding the sale of supplements are backward in that anybody can make a supplement. They can sell it and make whatever claims they like. The supplement will only be taken off the market if there is evidence of active harm. Now, of course, that's completely backward, right? Somebody should have to prove that their supplement is safe for human consumption before putting it on sale, but actually it works the other way around. So we're, we're in effect, we're all guinea pigs for the dietary supplement industry. The vast majority of these supplements don't deliver on their promises. Do, they, do they deliver on any of their promises? Do they do, they do anything good for us? There are a small handful of dietary supplements that might be beneficial. And you can look at the scientific consensus. You can look at position stands, for example, from the International Society of Sports Nutrition. You can look at the American Medical Association. They all have position stands on dietary supplements and even sports performance supplements and a very small handful. We're talking about maybe five or 10 different supplements that are supported by any kind of robust evidence, but by and large, the rest of them don't deliver on their promises. The reason that supplements are so popular for the same reason that ice bathing is popular, that acupuncture is popular, is that evolution has hardwired us for taking shortcuts. Mm. Back when we were hunter-gatherers, hunting and foraging for our food, the ability to take shortcuts and save energy was very beneficial. It served a very important survival advantage. But modern society has changed dramatically, more probably more in the last 50 years than in the last 500. And in our world of social media and commercialism and fake news, our hard wiring for taking shortcuts is being easily exploited. It's much easier to jump in an ice bath a couple of times a week, take a dietary supplement or put some tape on your body than it is to actually engage in the long-term practices that health professionals agree actually have the biggest effects. And those are regular exercise, healthy eating and physical activity. Aside from taking your money, um, is there any harm? I mean, what's, what's your concern about people trying those sorts of supplements? Again, to your point, it is a shortcut to getting to that place where you could do the long work and, and the hard work. But if, if people, people take them because they're busy, people take them because they're easy, people take them because they believe that they'll work. Is there any harm in that aside from the fact that, you know, it's going to cost you money? That's a great point. And that's one of the questions that I get asked almost as much as any other. And that is, what's the harm? If this thing isn't going to work, then why don't I just do it? Maybe it'll work. And if it doesn't, then what's the harm? And in some cases, I would say the minority of cases, there probably isn't any harm. The harm comes when we look at the downstream effects of using some of these unproven practices. So for example, ice bathing is relatively benign, but it's not completely benign. We heard at the top of the show from somebody with a heart condition. Now I would hope, I would assume that they've spoken to their primary care provider to ensure that it's safe for them to shock their body by jumping in the cold water, given that they have a heart condition. I don't know that that's the case, but certainly there are a small number of individuals who will suffer negative effects. They will suffer some kind Kind of cardiovascular event. I mentioned cupping a few minutes ago. Some people use cupping because they think that it will stop their muscles from being sore. There are some organizations who promote cupping for treating asthma symptoms. Uh, whole body cryotherapy, for example, it's when people stand in cold air. It's cooled to extremely low temperatures and they stand in cold air for between two and four minutes every other day. And they believe that it's going to suppress inflammation, help their bodies recover. Mm. But some people think that it will help them to heal from illness and disease. So when we ask what the harm is, and it's the same with dietary supplements, there is no harm if you're using this to treat a benign headache or a muscle ache or a sore back that's gonna get better on its own. The harm comes when people use these ineffective interventions to treat something that won't otherwise get better on its own, or when people start to forego science-based medical interventions in favor of unproven alternative therapies. That's when it can start to do real harm. And sadly, there are lots of very tragic cases in the media 
and in the scientific literature of people who have lost their lives from doing exactly that. And that's what we've got to try and combat. You said that there were like literally just a handful of some of these fitness trends that actually are shown to work. Um, can you just name one or two of them? Well, uh, for example, dietary supplements, that there, there is lots and lots of evidence now for a, a supplement called creatine. It's a performance supplement, not, not necessarily just for performance, but it's very beneficial for people who are trying to build strength and muscle mass. People use it in studied. weightlifting, for example. They use it in weightlifting, but there are implications for sports performance, for weightlifting, but also in any individual of any age, a man or woman who wants to improve their strength and improve their whole body strength and well-being. And so, for example, there are lots of studies looking at how older adults, so we're talking about people who are over 65 and older than that, who have used creatine alongside regular resistance training to improve muscle mass, improve strength, and to combat some of the effects of muscle wasting, which comes from inactivity. And creatine is just one supplement. It's not a magic supplement. It's not going to turn you from a regular person into a Greek god overnight, but it's fairly evidence-based and it's been studied for several decades. Uh, we know that regular exercise is extremely important and sometimes this is sold as you know some kind of package. It's wrapped up in a bow and it's sold to people as uh, some kind of panacea. And regular exercise is probably the least controversial advice you will ever get regarding how to improve your health and wellness. If mm. there was a pill that we could take that gave us all of the benefits of regular exercise, the inventor of that pill would, would win the Nobel Prize it just overnight. So there are a very small handful of interventions that can have a beneficial effect on the body. But as I've said, by and large, we are hardwired for quick fixes. And those are the things that we're going to turn to before anything else. Just before I let you go, I mean, we are inundated with studies and you will read about them. You'll hear about them almost every single day. This will do this. This will do that. More of this, less of this. Um, this is the exercise that you need to do to build this strength or what have you. What do you advise people to do? As, as they make their way through this and they're trying to figure out which of these things that they are being uh, inundated with in terms of advertisements, in terms of information, which of them actually would work and not? How do you, how do you teach somebody to be a skeptic? Well, I guess that the, the key bit of advice here is that we all have these ingrained critical faculties. We all have these tools to be able to make good decisions and we have to work to sharpen our tools. We can't rely on federal authorities to regulate the commercial industry. We can't rely on fitness influencers online to give us good advice out of the goodness of their hearts because there's a lot of money to be made. And we can't rely on social media platforms to regulate content on our behalf. These are private organizations, they're not publicly owned forums. So we must take steps to act as our own content regulators. And this is something that I'm very optimistic about. We can, through a bit of work, and persistence, we can become better thinkers. We can learn about our biases. We can learn about why we take shortcuts. We can understand how social media platforms work by promoting sensational content. We can become more media literate. And essentially, don't just assume that vendors of supplements and sports garments and the like are telling you the truth. Always ask for evidence when somebody is selling you something. And with a bit of time and with a bit of patience, we can sharpen our tools and we can become better thinkers. And that will benefit not just us, but for the people around us. And that's how we get a, a we can improve health and wellness. Again, not just health and wellness of, of ourselves, but for the people around us as well. Nick, thank you very much for this. Thank you. Nick Tiller is an exercise scientist at Harbor UCLA and the author of The Skeptic's Guide to Sports Science, Confronting Myths, of the health and fitness industry. He was in Montreal. Your thoughts on this welcome. How do you sift through those myths? How do you apply that skepticism to everything from the cold plunge to the green juice that you might drink in the morning? You can let us know. Email us, thecurrent at cbc.ca.